Welcome everyone to this week's Wednesday webinar. Um, as always, um, this is being live streamed on both Zoom and YouTube, and the recording will be available on YouTube after the presentation. Um, we'll be doing the Q&A after the presentation, so feel free to type your questions in during the presentation and we'll come to them at the end. You can get to it by, if you move your mouse around, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom. I have great pleasure in welcoming Owen Brazel this week, the president of the Web Deep Sky Society, and he'll be talking to us on observing planetary nebula. Over to you, Owen. Thank you, Andrew. And um, thank you for everyone taking your time out from observing F3. Um, what I would like to do here is to just give a sort of brief rundown on planetary nebulae and then some of the, the techniques and the tools that we can use to observe them. So first of all, it's worth noting that no planetary nebula is bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. So we had to really wait for the invention of the telescope um, for the first examples of this class of object to be found. And that was really done by, by Charles Messier, who discovered um, the nebula that he later catalogued as M27, or we know as the Dumbbell Nebula. And Messier then also went on to find, or along with his collaborators, find another four nebulae. Um, it has been of some historical interest that M57 um, has been traditionally assigned to Joseph Darquier, another French astronomer. Um, but in fact, it appears that Messier um, actually found this one uh, as well, independently from uh, Darquier. Messier, as we all know, was primarily interested in comets. Uh, he wasn't doing an all sky survey. Um, so the objects that he discovered were either on the tracks of comets he was following or in areas of sky where comets were likely to be discovered. Overlapping Messier, certainly towards the end of his career, was probably the, one of the most famous of all of the uh, visual um, deep sky observers in William Herschel. Now Herschel set out to do his job slightly differently from Messier, and he was very much interested in looking at how the heavens were constructed. So he set up his telescope in basically a meridian transit mode um, and then observed everything that passed through it. Um, as we can see on the right hand side here, um, health and safety was not an important part of astronomy in those days, though obviously getting dressed up to observe was. Now Herschel, because he had much larger telescopes and, and better telescopes than Messier, um, was able to resolve a number of Messier's discoveries into stars. And he felt that with a large enough telescope, all of these objects could be resolved into stars. However, he had a few problems with this, one of which was um, he believed he could see changes in M42, um, the Orion Nebula, um, which would be incompatible with stars. But then later on, he found another object, um, which we now know is NGC 1514. And as he describes here, um, he felt that because the bright star in the middle was so much brighter than the rest of it, then it really couldn't be um, composed of stars or else this star would have to be so much brighter. And he felt that there was um, some kind of shining fluid. I mean, he didn't know what it was, um, but at least he felt that there were objects out there that weren't formed purely of stars. Now, working on from the Herschels, I mean, John Herschel himself also discovered cotton nebulae, um, Herschel tried to classify things. Astronomy then, as to a certain extent now, um, was very much in the botany mode, where you collected as many objects of different types, try to break it down to see what appeared. And because Herschel had found a number of these objects that looked to him um, like the planet Uranus that he'd already discovered, um, he made a separate classification of planetary nebulae. Now, not all of the objects that ended up in this class were actually what we would now call planetary nebulae, um, but a number of them were. And the name planetary nebula has stuck um, as given by Herschel to it. Following on from Herschel, we had 
Lord Ross, who obviously was making very much bigger telescopes culminating um, in the 72 inch at Burr. And on the right here, we see a very startled looking planetary nebula um, that was obviously being observed. Interestingly, this drawing does show that people don't always pick out what's there, as this is a drawing of the Owl Nebula M97. Um, and it shows stars in each of the eye patches, which we now know aren't there. So possible suggestion of too much Irish whiskey um, before observing this object. But Lord Ross felt that um, he was able to observe, um, to uh, break down some of Messier's, uh, Messier and Herschel's nebulae, M27 for instance, into stars and therefore he moved very much toward, back towards the resolvability of all nebulae. And here again we see um, the 72 inch in operation Again, health and safety were not a prime concern um, on using this telescope with the gantry over a very large drop when you were trying to use the telescope um, at night. Um, you can also note that top hats were a requirement for when observing in those days. People, because there was no photography, had to really very much draw what they were seeing. And there have been a number of suggestions that drawing is not compatible with modern uh, observations. Um, but this set of drawings by Andrew Secchi, perhaps better known for his work on spectroscopy, um, shows that a good artist could very much represent what we could see. So here we have in blue his drawings and on the right uh, comparison images taken by modern uh, imaging systems. And you can see that he was pretty accurate in what he could see and what he could draw. The problem of what the nebulae were was not really resolved until William Huggins came along. And Huggins was starting to look at all nebulae with a spectroscope, in this case, a visual spectroscope. So he wasn't taking images of the spectra. And he turned his telescope plus spectrograph onto NGC 6543, perhaps better known as the Cat's Eye Nebula in 1864. And rather than seeing a continuous spectrum, uh, he was able to show um, that it was primarily a bright line spectrum and hence that from a glowing gas. And this is the spectrum that he drew um, along with uh, a drawing by Curtis from Lick Publications 18. And of course the famous Hubble image of the, the nebula itself as we see it today. Um, so the argument was pretty much over um, as to whether these objects were stars or made of stars or gas, and they turned out to be gas. Here we can see another example of the spectra, again taken um, from 1918. Um, this is again with, with Lick, and we can see here um, that the spectra show images of the nebula because they weren't fast enough to be able to take lines. Um, but there were some very odd uh, lines in the spectra and those can be shown up here around N1, N2. Now these were lines in the spectra that didn't appear in any known elements. So because the element helium had been discovered on the sun, they felt that maybe they discovered a new element in space. And this was called nebulium because it wasn't seen anywhere else. So this led us on to trying to understand what are planetary nebulae. Now, the whole idea of planetary nebulae has changed dramatically in the last 30 years ago. But the very first way we, we try and understand what an object is, is to look at its distribution um, with respect to the Milky Way. So, here we can see the little dots are where planetary nebulae have been found. And as we can see, they very much lie in the plane of our distribution of the Milky Way and with an obvious concentration at around the center. We can perhaps see that better here with this view uh, where all the little red dots are planetary nebulae that we know. Um, the sun is down here. 
Um, so we can see that most of the planetary nebulae we see are fairly local to us um, in the spiral arms with a concentration perhaps towards the bulge. And similarly, if we take a view of the distribution of planetary nebulae um, in the plane, we can see that the majority of them do lie in the plane of the galaxy. Now, some of them here appear to be distributed away from the plane, um, but you have to remember that the plane of the galaxy isn't infinitely thin and the sun does lie in it, or perhaps slightly below it, um, so objects that are close to us um, would appear at a, perhaps a higher angle. So what did we think these are? So pre-Hubble Space Telescope, um, we thought that most stars with a mass range of maybe 0.9 to 6 solar masses would become a planetary nebula. And the most popular model is the inter interacting stellar winds or ISW where the assumption was that as a star entered the later stages of its life, um, it would start to lose mass, unlike most humans, which seem to gain mass. Um, and this mass would be lost in a stellar wind during the red giant and AGB stage. And this would eventually expose the hot core of the star, which would provide a fast wind and high energy ultraviolet photons, which would first of all ionize that element but the fast wind would push the gas out <clears throat> and form the shapes that we see today. However, the Hubble Space Telescope showed that planetary nebulae were far more complicated than the simple interstellar wind model could explain, um, particularly in the shapes. And there then became suggestions that a single star like our sun could not become a planetary nebula. It wouldn't form the shapes required and you needed to have a binary system or possibly a common envelope system um, to be able to form the shapes of planetary nebulae that we see. However, as usual, the observational evidence wasn't there and still isn't there, um, that enough of the central stars in planetary nebulae are binaries um, to make this the only way to form a planetary nebula. So, Basically, um, although research is going on continually, um, it may be that there's more than one way of making a planetary nebula. And as we can see, nature does not have a problem making them. Um, it's just we have a problem understanding how they're made. And the way that they form may be either mass or binary dependent. And it's possible um, even that shaping a nebula does not require a binary companion. Um, but you could perhaps do it with a, a brown dwarf or possibly even a very large Jupiter type planet. The other problem we have that our predictions suggest there may be 25,000 planetary nebulae in the galaxy at this time. And we only know from our surveys of maybe three and a half thousand. So there does seem to be um, a discrepancy in how we understand these things work. But to summarize, planetary nebulae are believed still to be the end points of the life of stars between one and eight solar masses. Beyond eight solar masses, they will almost certainly end their lives as type two supernovae. They don't last very long on an astronomical time frame, and they live for maybe 40 to 60,000 years. Um, and after that, they, the star at the center becomes too cool to light them up but also they will disperse into the surrounding medium. They also tend to expand quite slowly um, in between 20 and 40 kilometers per second when you compare it to a nova or a supernova, which are in the thousands of kilometers per second. So here we have a montage of images, not all of which are obviously planetary nebulae, um, but it does give you um, perhaps a flavor um, of some of the different shapes um, that these things can take. And here we have some very deep images of M57 on the left and M27 um, on the right, um, which show that the area that we normally see visually, in, at least, um, is only a small part of, of the nebula itself. And this surrounding material um, is becoming more common 
um, as we get deeper and deeper images of planetary nebulae and pick up some of the halos. Um, this is another one. This isn't M27. This is one known as MWP1, um, but it shows a very similar form to uh, M27 itself. Planetary nebulae also vary dramatically on in si physical size. And this diagram sort of shows um, some of the more popular nebulae, um, and it gives you some idea of how big they really are. So up here on the left, we have Abel 39, which is coming towards the end of its life. It's as a planetary nebula, about four light years across. Um, and then coming down, um, background, so M57 is not a particularly large nebula, um, and then we get down to sort of objects that are more in the protoplanetary or very young stages. And we have to remember that some planetary nebulae may only be a few thousand years old, and now we're starting to get much better ideas of how they evolve. Uh, this is another particularly nice one. Um, if you ever need something on Halloween to stick on your door to scare the children away, um, this is a planetary nebula um, which is showing signs of interacting with its local interstellar medium um, and producing these kind of strange shapes. Uh, perhaps a more popular example would be Abel 21, the Medusa nebula. And this is Abel 39, again, perhaps known as a diamond ring from um, the star on its edge, which of course is not associated with it. They do form much more complicated structures, as we can see here, um, but in general, they tend to be symmetric about a certain line. So if we drew a line down the center here, um, we can see there is a certain symmetry um, going across it. In some cases, that symmetry may be difficult to find. Um, this object was thought to be initially a galaxy and then perhaps a strange um, emission nebula, but has in fact been shown um, to be a planetary nebula. Unfortunately, it's in the southern hemisphere for, for northern observers. So why would we want to go about observing planetary nebulae? Well, as it says here, there's a wide range of targets suitable for all sizes of telescopes and observing conditions. They are some of the few types to show color. The invention of the nebula filter, admittedly now quite a long time ago in the early 1980s, made them a popular target. Um, if you're stuck inside and don't want to go out, you can still search for planetary nebula on your computer. And in certain cases, light pollution is making it difficult to find other types of objects. Um, so here we, here we have an example of the kinds of telescopes one could use from a, small short tube 80 mil refractor up to very large Dobsonians. This would have been a picture taken at the Kelling Star Party a number of years ago. What makes them interesting though, and we've seen this with the early pictures of the spectra that Huggins took, was that they do show a certain bat set of emission lines rather than a continuous spectra. And we could design a filter which just passed those lines. You do have to be a little careful though because like everything there are exceptions to this rule. So here we have um, a spectra of another three planetary nebulae from the Lick 18, 1918 publication and you can see a little at the top NGC 6826 does show the very strong lines from um, nebulium. Um, NGC 40 doesn't sh and show them at all, um, neither does um, Campbell's hydrogen star or BD plus 3369. Um, so you do have to think a little more carefully rather than just going out and, and blindly using a filter. So what was Nebulium? Well, as it says here, when they were first examined, they found these bright lines of an unknown origin. They thought it was a new element. They named it Nebulium because of helium first being found in the solar that solar spectrum. However, in 1917, Ira Bowen showed that Nebulium came from um, a particular state of oxygen or doubly ionized oxygen. So these became known as forbidden lines. And as it says there, in general, in astrophysical cases, they're excited by collision, not by radiation. 
the decay times are of the order of a few seconds rather than millionths of a second for normal lines. And because of that, they only occur in very low density environments. And even with the best vacuums on Earth, we've not been able to reproduce that. And when you see them, um, they tend to be the forbidden lines will be represented by the element and square brackets around it. Um, just for confusion, there are semi forbidden lines which only have one square bracket. So this is what we're trying to look at, and, and this is a very important um, diagram. So here we have the emission lines of oxygen um, and the hydrogen beta line. And this gray curve is an important curve because this is the color response of your nighttime vision. So basically from the rods, um, which is what gives you the, the low light level. Um, and as we can see here, um, they tend to peak very close, luckily for us, um, to the O3 lines in hydrogen, um, but they have almost no response out in the red region of the spectrum. Hence, you can design a filter um, to use this. In this case, it would be an ultra con high contrast filter um, that passes those lines. Now, many of these filters also have a red leak, um, which isn't important really, um, because we can't see there. Um, and so unless you have a pet snake that's interested in astronomy, um, we're not, it doesn't matter. Now, if you're a CCD imager, of course it does. So uh, this is the reason why CCD filters tend to be more expensive. They can't um, have a red leak. And here are some um, idealistic drawings of a filter bandpass. Um, if you're more interested in filters, there is a, a um, article on the BAA website on filters that was put up a few months ago, or perhaps last year, I can't remember, which goes into this in far more detail. Um, but you can see that we can design filters pretty much to go over any bands we want. So you can design an each beta filter um, as well. Those are idealized ones. Uh, people are um, actually measuring true band passes of filters. Um, and this is a website where someone has, where you could send your filter, they would measure it, um, and then you could put it up and see what the actual band pass is, or if you have a measuring spectrograph of your own, then you could do it yourself. Now, many years ago, um, a former member of the BAA, Morris Gavin, um, made a filter response um, device and we actually measured the the colored response of a number of filters and this shows um, embarrassingly a collection of filters that I had um, where you can see that the O3 lines and how the band pass of filters worked and then later on at a deep sky section meeting in 2005 probably longer ago than most of us want to remember um, he took it along to the deep sky section meeting and people brought their filters um, and we had a look at that. How are these made? Well, they're made as an interference filter. You have to deposit a dielectric coating to about an accuracy of about a quarter of the length of light. Um, and this could be up to 60 layers of a coating. So this is not a cheap process. Um, and it also means that because of the nature of the interference, light really has to pass orthogonally through the layers in order to get the, in, the interference pattern that you want. If it passes at an angle, um, one of two things may happen. The central band pass might shift, um, which is the way that H alpha filters used for solar observing are tuned in most cases, um, or the contrast may drop. Poor quality filter you can see here, it has very poor transmission um, and there are definitely things that aren't wrong with it, wrong with that. So what do they do? Well, they increase the contrast basically between the background and the object. Light's always going to be lost as no filter has 100% transmission. Um, and there are certain times when you should use the different kinds of filters. So as it says there, an O3 with the low power, UHC with medium power, and perhaps at high power, um, no filter at all. So there, there are still a number of challenges um, associated with filters when purchasing them. Um, it may be a surprise to know that there are about 125 different makes and types of these filters. 
Uh, many of them, as it says, there are Chinese clones often rebadged from, from one maker. And the challenge with these is that the quality control isn't necessarily what you would hope. Um, so that different batches may have different band passes. The band passes may change for time for a different filter, um, which means it's often quite difficult to recommend a filter to a person um, just because of this. Um, it's not just the Chinese that had this problem. Um, Lumicon, who were one of the main makers of filters, um, went through a, a number of stages where their filters um, weren't as con this consistent as you perhaps might have hoped. Um, as it says there on the Cloudy Nights form, there is a, a, um, a Nebula filter spreadsheet, which will tell you a lot about them. And you can also have odd filters. Um, so anti-nebula filters, you might think this is a bit of an odd thing to do. Um, but if you want to see the central star of a planetary nebula, then you might want to um, cut out the light. Um, variable filters um, originally came along a long time ago. I don't know if there's anybody actually making those. And you can also have helium line filters, which show different parts of a planetary nebula. Hopefully most of you will see what they look like. They come in, well, classically two inch and inch and a quarter sizes. And you can see here um, from the different makes that they obviously have a different band pass. The Teleview one there, this is old Teleview, had um, a different band pass to a Lumicon filter just from the colors that are coming through it. In general, you use them by screwing on the back of an eyepiece. Um, hopefully um, they will screw on well, but there was never any discussion between the filter makers and the eyepiece makers as to what the thread looked like. So sometimes you have your precious filter hanging in there by only a couple of turns. Filter slides sound like a nice idea. Obviously in the UK with a wet and damp climate, this doesn't really work. Um, and in order to get this to work, you will almost certainly need a Barlow lens as well. Um, or if you're willing to expose your filters to the elements, um, even with a heated line, um, you could perhaps do it like that. Uh, the other way of using them is to blink the filter, which is, um, means moving it between the eye and eyepiece and looking for an object that doesn't dim as much. Now, nebula filters will always dim it, and hydrogen beta filter will dim an object by almost 100 times. Um, and the UHC perhaps by a couple of magnitudes. Um, so the stars will appear to dim, um, but the nebula won't. However, as it says there, this is not so easy to do and you're likely to potentially drop an expensive filter, which isn't a great idea, even if it's on grass. Another idea that came around a long time ago was um, to use a filter, uh, a prism, or perhaps a spectrograph to look at it. And Ed Barker described how this could be done in the Web Society um, volume, uh, Deep Sky Handbook Volume 2 in 1977. Um, really, I, I mean, that must be a very difficult way of trying to position the filter in the eyepiece and see the spectra. Um, people made transmission grating eyepieces. Barish and Long did one. Um, they were transmission grating filters. Um, and people had direct vision spectrographs. This is a, a Goto one that. Um, had been in the BA instrument collection many years ago, and I, I, I purchased it off them. Um, and um, the star analyzer, which is a uh, use for spectroscopy more, um, is actually a screw in filter, which will screw into the bottom of your eyepiece and will show um, a spectra. And just to show what might be seen with a star analyzer, um, this is a picture that was taken um, on the 100th anniversary of the um, NGC 6543 being shown to be a, um, an emission nebula. And here we can see what it would see through a camera. And visually, um, all you really get to see is the bright O3 line, and that is the zero order um, on the star. Um, but they can be used to hunt out very small planetary nebulae. So eyepieces, where do we go? Well, eyepieces have always been a controversial subject, um, but for planetary nebulae, um, because most of them are small, you need a high power, which means a short focal length. And of course, if you have a long F-ratio telescope, that could in fact be quite a long focal length. 
Um, but for large planetary nebulae, then you will need a wide field eyepiece. Um, as this slide says, planetary nebulae can take high power when the seeing um, allows. Um, and uh, we, I, a colleague and I have used on his very large driven telescope, um, powers up to 800 times or more. And you can see an amazing amount of detail uh, when the seeing is good enough. However, you can always over magnify. And as it says there, the usual limits from optics apply. Um, and it mentioned right at the beginning, color can be seen. Um, however, it will vary. People have different color responses and it appears um, that men and women have quite different color responses as well, which means it's very difficult to compare color views. And all you can really do is say, well, I see a color which is X and no color then is right or wrong. Um, and as it says, many men are in fact colorblind to a certain degree anyway. So we have a number of planetary nebula catalogs to work from. Uh, Messier was obviously the first, um, the Herschel and um, Dreyer put together. Um, the NGC, most of which were discovered visually, and then there were 36 found in the index catalogues. Um, Vorontsov and Yarmanov made another catalogue in 1934, which had 288 of them in it. Um, but the first real catalogue was the PK in 1967, where there were 1300. Um, 1992, the ESO um, came up with a, another one, which had about 1500 in it, which wasn't completely overlapping with the 1300 in the first one. And then Kahootek came up with his own version and numbering system again in 2000. Um, the MASH catalogues are nothing to do with Korean war dramas, but were made on the last big photographic survey done by the um, UK Schmidt on hydrogen alpha plates of the Southern Milky Way. Um, and they found on their first pass about 900, and then with a lot more processing, they found another 350. Um, the IFAS catalog was from the Isaac Newton um, survey done again in the uh, H alpha band um, to try and find northern nebulae, and they found about 500 um, that they've so far published anyway. So where do you find a definitive list? Well, it's probably now the online hash database. Um, there's a link to that at the end of the presentation. Um, there probably isn't a complete list in 2000, since 2001 in text form, which obviously gives a challenge to software writers. But as I said, new planetary nebulae are found all the time, often by amateurs now. And as it says there, the French CCD images are particularly good at finding new nebulae. Just so we've got something to compare, Vorontsov Eliamos came up with a classification system. Um, this was primarily based on photographic and visual description, so it may not have much relevance to the physical structure anymore. Um, but still, um, it will give you some idea as to what you might be able to see. So we have a number of popular lists, Messier, NGC, Index Catalog, and the Astronomical League's Planetary Nebula Club. After the NGC, um, the Abel PN list has proved very popular for well, many years now. Um, the Abel list has, well, originally had 86 objects in it, but the number of planetary nebulae keeps dropping and there are a number of, um, of objects that don't exist. Uh, Abel 17, for instance, is a plate fault, even though people have described seeing it, um, which is quite interesting. Um, and it says there many of the Minkowski planetary nebulae are quite bright. Um, the clear skies people, have produced a number of online downloadable guides um, to the Abel and the Mike, uh, certainly now with the 2.3 version, the Minkowski Nebulae. So you can uh, download these and see what's actually there. Either that or you've got to go back to the original sources. So um, that's the uh, SCGPN um, catalog which is available probably only online now. Um, the Abel list, Minkowski lists, and then um, there was a very good book by Heinz called Planetary Nebula on a Catalogue and Handbook, and that contained all of the objects at the time. And the Webb Society's book, despite being over 30, almost 30 years old now, um, over 30 years old now, um, still contains a list that you might be able to see with smaller telescopes. 
Having said that, not all of these things are easy to find. Um, you can get finder charts, so paper is still around, though obviously much less common now. Um, computer, star charts, photographic or digitized photographic, so the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey, real sky for those who remember it, and the digitized sky survey, which is an online resource. And you can also get specialized finder charts from the PK and other sources. There is an online viewer called Aladdin. Uh, I haven't missed out a, an L there, that's what it's called. It's now at version 11, so this is version 10, but it allows you to bring up images of nebulae in different wave bands and compare what you may or may not be able to see um, with that. So it's quite useful. Megastar 5, this is a now somewhat out of date. SkyMap Pro 12, out of date, no longer updated, and the website is gone. Sky X, which seems to be uh, beloved by images. Starry Night Pro is more of a planetarium program. Um, Cart UCL obviously is free. The guide 9.1 is now free under a GNU license and uh, a very popular program, which is more again of a planetarium program and a charting program is Stellarium, which is now at 20.2. Um, this just gives you an idea of what Megastar could do. Shows an overlay of the DSS. Um, with um, here we have M46, NGC 2438, a very bright planetary nebulae, and Minkowski 118, which is a rather fainter nebula um, up in the same area. Perhaps what's being done more now are planning software. Um, Sky Tools 3.4 is perhaps the most expensive of those um, and possibly the best. Um, Astro Planner. Deep Sky Planner, Iron Telescope, which was a German program, um, uh, it's no longer being actively developed. And uh, he has just released it as freeware with 331 version, which you can download and install and use. And something that was very popular in the, in the past, Deep Sky Astronomy software, um, it says here it's no longer being actively developed. It software was effectively deprecated. Um, but if you like SQL queries, it's a way to go. So this is just an example of what Sky Tools 4 would allow you to show. Um, it obviously gives you information, rise and set times of the nebulae, uh, when might be best to see it, etc. It does produce very nice charts. This is um, a chart of the same reason we saw before, um, and it's showing M46, um, Calabash or Rotneg Nebula and Minkowski 118. Um, you can also overlay DSS images on that should you want to. Um, Deep Sky Planner 7 um, is probably the next best in line, and it does have a unique point for those of us interested in planetary nebulae, um, in that it contains, as it says there, emission line nebulae uh, data, which can help you select the best kind of filter to use. So here it's showing the strongest emission lines, so NGC 40, there's no 03. Um, so if you want to get an idea of what filter to use, um, this software will, will give you that information. Um, and one of the advantages is that you can create these plans and then use them on a mobile device in the field. Uh, Astro Planner um, is the only native um, Windows and Mac program. It's undergoing slow cycle development, um, mostly bug fixing, I think now with the hope of getting uh, version 232 out the door. And this is just an example of what Iron Telescope 331 does. You do need to be a little careful though. Um, this is uh, Iron Telescope will connect with other charting programs, in this case Megastar. Um, however, they do contain errors. So this is a chart where it thinks that a nebula called Sharpless 271 is, and as we can see, there's nothing in the center, and Sharpless 271 is over here. Um, so that not all these things have corrected positional data, which um, can be a challenge when you're looking for them. So don't always believe what you see. More people are going to mobile apps now. So Sky Safari, very popular, StarMap Pro, Observer Pro, um, and these others. Um, most of these are iOS, which is unfortunately what I tend to use, um, but some of them are Android as well. Um, so Sky Safari obviously goes that way. And this just gives an example of what you might get from these programs. Um, so this is Observer Pro with the Planetary Nebula list. And you can see it shows you rise, set times, 
uh, and a picture of said nebula. Asteroid, quite useful. You put your telescope eyepiece combination in and it'll allow you to download a picture and show you what your eyepiece field might look like. Um, this is fairly stick. I did mention amateur searches. So these take two forms. One is um, searching the online surveys. Um, and this has been fairly productive. Um, and people find, still find quite a lot of new nebulae that the professionals didn't pick up. And um, there was a group called Deep Sky Hunters that used to collate these, but this seems to now be taken over by um, the French and we'll show a website which solves that. Also, um, people are finding these in their images. So on the right here, we have something that became known as the Soap Bubble Nebula, and that's its classification. Um, and this is the amateur image of it. Um, and this is very near NGC 6888. Um, Interestingly, three people independently discovered it within about four weeks, so it was an object whose time had come. Um, and this is what happens when you have a four meter telescope at your disposal um, to get a picture. But this again shows the classical signs of a planetary nebula. So if we haven't, I haven't put you off, then there are a number of resources that are useful. Um, and these are books that either have his, uh, the sort of information on the physics side of it in Quark's book or observationally here. Um, this is a, an extremely good book by one person um, who created or observed hundreds of planetary nebulae um, with first of all a C8 and then a 20 inch. And he self published that on eBay um, with 100 copies. Um, and that has now sold out. However, um, whether or not I'm allowed to do a plug, I don't know. But if you want a copy now, the Web Society, with his permission, um, is reprinting that book or has reprinted that book. Um, so you can buy it from us. Um, and the Interstellar and Deep Sky Guide gives you drawings and images of challenging nebulae. Um, if you want to know where to find more information, um, these are a number of websites where you can hunt them down. And I mentioned the French site, planetarynebulae.net. Um, and this key is kept up to base, up to date with um, new discoveries um, by both people searching the online surveys and also ones discovered. Now, the French um, have also started to spectrographically um, confirm their nebulae. They, I think, have been using an LP600 on a telescope probably on peak de midi um, to confirm whether or not these things um, have the spectra and thus are true planetary nebulae or something else. And to end with, um, here is a quote from William Scott Houston on what he thought about planetary nebulae and why we should observe them. So thank you very much for listening. Um, hopefully this has provided some information and we will try and take questions when ready, I guess. Thank you, Owen, for a fascinating talk. Uh, Planetary Nebula are definitely a favourite of mine to look uh, with the eye. Um, just before we start on the Q&A, to let everyone know, to ask questions, you can click at the Q&A button at the bottom. I'll come to and I'll read them out. And for anyone watching on YouTube, I'll try and keep them out, see if we get any questions coming in that way. And just a little plug for next week when we have Supernova Betagers by Dr. Mark Kijas. That's next Wednesday. Uh, for the Q&A, we're going to be joined by Nick Hewitt and Stuart Moore. So Nick, I'm just going to find you in the list and I'm just going to promote you to panellist. So you should, in a moment, be able to speak and share your video. And Stuart Moore, Stuart, I'm about to do the same to you to move you in, so you should be able to uh, talk as well as listen, which you have been. So I can see you've both joined. Um, at the moment, Nick and Stuart, you both have your microphones and videos turned off. I think ah, Nick's just activating his. You know. all. Hi, Nick. At least they put a planetary nebula up behind you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Not the topic of the moment, is it? But uh, no, that was very good. 
And I, I see Stuart still muted. Um, Stuart, I'm just going to try unmuting you. Ah, oh, I see you're unmuted now. Yeah. Hi, Stuart. Hello there. Great. So we started to get some questions coming in. So the first one is from John Sully. What is the convention for colouring planetary nebula images? Um, so I'm guessing um, if you're talking about imaging, um, then the convention. Oh, Andrew, over to you. Yes, sir. Um, it says you want to answer that question live. I'm guessing. Oh, that's... no, don't worry. That's oh, just because okay. I'm um, and what I'm doing is I'm oh, just sorry. I'll be looking um, so off the list. So if you're worry. talking about imaging, there really isn't a convention. Uh, images tend to use different palettes um, to um, to show different things. So obviously the Hubble palette got quite common. Uh, most of those obviously were designed to show particular wave bands. Um, and colour, I think, is very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, I mean, Nick, what would you say on this convention? I, I, I generally feel that L LRGB is um, still my favourite. Digital SLRs actually give a very nice colour uh, color rendition without really having to fiddle around with it much. So um, small telescopes, larger telescopes with a di digital SLR will show colour in the, of a sort of turquoisey, greeny blue. Um, you don't really need to do anything further than that because I think that gives a very natural look. Um, with LRGB, of course, it can be a little bit more manipulated um, with CCDs and CMOS sensors, but um, uh, I, I, I don't think one has to fiddle around too much. It, a lot of people like Hubble uh, palettes, but I don't think they work particularly well for planetary nebulae. I don't know, I'm kind of mine, I won't make any comment. <laughs> <clears throat> um, is Star Walk 2 useful for planetary nebulae? Um, unfortunately, I can't answer that question because I haven't used the program um, and I don't know what databases it, um, it contains. I don't know if anybody, anybody else on the panel has tried to use that program. I haven't, I'm afraid, no. Uh, so sorry about that, Jack. I can't really answer that question for you. Um, and James, um, what the appearance of planet? Oh, yeah, sorry. What size scope is needed to see colours in planetary nebulae? Um, which PN and Vizial from the UK are most likely to reveal colour? Um, so you're probably going to need a scope in the fifteen centimetre class or above. Um, the colours that you will see will very much depend on your own colour perception, um, but you're looking at bright compact ones. So NGC 6826, um, 6210, um, NGC 7662. Um, a lot of these large or, or, or these brighter planetary nebulae will show um, some form of colour. Um, and it, you, you obviously want something that's going to rise fairly high. Um, if you're trying to see colour in some of the more obscure ones, so um, we mentioned Campbell's hydrogen star, which has no O3 emission, um, but through a large telescope, so say in the 50 centimetre class, um, possibly slightly lower, um, it will show an interesting pink colour. Um, and there are reports of IC418, which is in Lepus just below Orion, showing a reddish colour with certain telescopes and magnifications. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the brighter planetary nebulae in the NGC will show that. Um, most of the Messier ones don't, surprisingly. No, I agree. I have seen colour in um, a small planetary nebula in Sagittarius which Owen will probably fill the catalogue number in, um, with a four, four inch refractor really quite well. It was very gorgeous greeny colour. Small one, high, high, highly uh, compacted really, the high surface brightness, but even a four inch it can do it. Okay. 
what's a four inch? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, appearance of planetary nebulae appears by 3D shapes, such as spheres, cotton bobbins, irregular shapes. Um, well, that's a very good question. How much is that is formed from stellar jets and magnetic fields from the white dwarf? Um, so the more complex shapes, particularly butterfly ones, um, would appear to require some form of torus to collimate the outflows. Um, and the shape that you see um, often depends on, on the object's orientation. So classically, we all thought M57 was a ring, um, but in fact, it looks like we're looking down the barrel of a cylinder. Um, and the same thing applies to the helix nebula. So magnetic fields are usually a catch-all in astronomy because modeling them is so difficult. Um, but they will obviously play a part in how the nebula are shaped. Um, but you really need very detailed observations with large telescopes and a spectroscope or spectrograph to enable you to figure out what the real shape of a planetary nebula is. Um, so the collimation, yes, is required by that. Jets are an interesting challenge um, as to how these work, and particularly when you have uh, multipolar nebulae, um, which appear to have different rings and different jets at different times. So that would appear to be a processing system. Um, but yes, that's an ongoing challenge. So why haven't we been able to see more of them? Right. Um, obviously, a, a large number will be behind the center of the galaxy, so we won't be able to see them. Um, there are a lot, uh, as we use more surveys um, in the infrared, so Herschel Telescope, for instance, and Spitzer um, found quite a few more. Um, but the challenge is are our understandings right and really are there that many in the first place so we don't fully understand why we don't see as many as we think we ought to um, but that may be that our understanding of how they're formed um, isn't as, as good as we hoped um given the time scales numbers apparently in every creation events um observable. Um, yes, so the big problem with uh, forming planetary nebulae is that um, they tend to form behind a dust cocoon from the central, the um, dust thrown off by the, the star that's forming it. So visually, no, um, but we are seeing with things like ALMA in the submillimeter and with the Spitzer and things like that in the infrared, um, we are able to see into these cocoons, um, but we don't always have the resolution needed to be able to understand precisely what is happening. Um, all we know is that um, even in protoplanetary nebulae, the, the shape appears to be imprinted on them at quite a young age. Um, so this is part of the challenge in, in understanding um, what they're doing. However, um, because with some of the closer ones, uh, we can see them changing over time. Um, and a few years ago, I was helping out an Australian school where they were taking images of um, a planetary nebula. And over a, you know, a relatively short period of time, you know, 10 years or so, um, they were able to show that the planetary nebulae was, um, was evolving. Um, so we do see um, nebulae very young, you know, maybe only a thousand years old, um, but the actual formation is, is still hidden from us. Uh, has Gaia given us anything useful, possibly for stars with them, not, even if not the fuzzy bits? <laughs> so um, Gaia is primarily astrometric. Um, so what Gaia has been able to do for us is to um, give us distances um, to some of the central stars. Now, uh, understanding the evolution of any stellar object requires accurate distances. And for planetary nebulae, in most cases, these have been very poorly known. 
So the hope is that with Gaia, um, certainly with the later data releases, um, then um, we will get accurate distances and that will enable us to calibrate um, what we're looking at. I mean, Gaia is not really going to show anything useful about the nebula itself, um, but getting information on the central star and the distances and how they evolve um, is going to be extremely useful. And there have been a number of papers on Gaia distances and information on, on that. Right, uh, James, do amateur observations of planetary nebulae contribute to scientific research or is, is observing or imaging them just for fun? Um, from the case of visual observing, uh, I think we could say it's probably just for fun. Um, for imaging them, then with today's images, um, we are able to confirm new discoveries and obviously amateurs are finding new nebulae um, from their imaging. Um, I don't think, um, you know, we're contributing anything necessary to the, to the physical understanding, but obviously finding more um, is important. Nick, Stuart, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think I think it's the discovery um, by, by amateurs is still quite remarkable in view of the you know all the various other surveys that have gone on, and I think that's probably the main, the main uh, thrust of the amateur uh, contribution here. I, I agree with you entirely that the visual um, observation is purely for fun, but there's a lot to be said for fun. I, I agree with Nick there. Yes, it, it is great fun, but I think also it's a bit like supernova discoveries. If the amateurs discover them, then professionals can look at them. And whereas professionals possibly haven't got the time to do the sort of surveys that amateurs like doing, then I think it's, there's still great work that can be done by amateurs. But, it, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's great fun. They are beautiful objects. Yeah. Um, I also see we have a question which has come in via the chat, which is from Diane. Uh, good evening, Owen. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Do planetary nebulae have an average size and is the chemical makeup the same? So, um, to take the second part first, um, the chemical makeup of planetary nebulae is used as a diagnostic of the chemical evolution of a galaxy, or what well, our galaxy anyway. Um, so by observing planetary nebulae in different parts of the galaxy, um, halo in the outer arms, etc., we find the chemical makeup is slightly different from perhaps ones in different areas. So you can use planetary nebulae to as a chemical tracer of the evolution of the galaxy. Um, the answer to this first question is no, they don't, because obviously they are evolving all the time. Um, it turns out that at their brightest, um, they tend to interestingly have an, a, a similar absolute magnitude and they can be used and have been used as distance indicators um, to other galaxies because uh, on-band, off-band image will show up planetary nebulae in other galaxies. I, if you take one on O3 and then uh, off that, you can difference the image and the planetary nebulae will stand out. Um, but they they tend to um, obviously that their shape will will change with time, and as they they expand, they'll they'll disappear. Uh, any planetary nebulae discovered in other galaxies? Yes, so lots basically. Um, in the LMC and SMC, there are planetary nebulae, some of which are visible to the um, to to. Um, amateurs with small tele well, telescopes. Um, M31 and certainly out as far as the Virgo cluster, we are discovering um, lots of different, um, of different planetary nebulae. So they are common in, in all galaxies and appear to be similar in the way they evolve. Um, but obviously once you get beyond the LMC, SMC, um, from the amateur point of view, uh, visually anyway, you're not going to see them. Um, 
it's possible that if amateurs did on band off band imaging, then they might be able to see them on on those. I don't know, Nick. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> not none to add to your very erudite comments, really. I, I think uh, you you pretty summed it up very well. Uh, James, uh, one book you get for amateurs particularly interested in moving on. Um, Stuart, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think probably sort of Night Sky Observer's Guide is a very good sort of summary of so many good objects. I mean, it's not just planetary nebulae. I mean, it gives very good descriptions, particularly for, for different size telescopes. So I think if, if I was just going to have one book, I would have that for, for observing this. But actually, a book about what they are, I still like Suncock's Cosmic Butterflies. I think that's very good. Yeah. That, there, there is also volume two of Web Society. <laughs> I still use that actually. I mean, the Web Society handbook, if it's I don't know if it's still available, but it's uh, it's still a very useful book despite its um, increasing age. But I would agree with Stuart, the Night Sky Observer's Guide is is super for giving you a lot of planetary nebulae, uh, a good variety too. Yeah, so um Web Society's book not available from us anymore, but it's available for a small number of pounds. 10 or so off um, Amazon or a books, um, you can get it. Um, Stuart references the Night Sky Observer's Guides, Wilman Bell one, um, possibly now the volume four, which covers the Milky Way, um, which obviously covers lots of planetary nebulae in there. Um, if you can get your copy hands on a copy of um, Stephen Hines's book, um, it, it's still very interesting, though it, it tends to be very expensive on the second-hand market, and it's obviously been out of print for um, for many years now. Um, unfortunately, there's not really been um, another really good book on amateur planetary nebulae for for many years now. Um, and the, the Kent Wallace one is, is quite interesting if you if you want to read descriptions of hundreds of them. Um, plus his experiences. Um, so there we go. Um, do you three have a penny but planetary nebula? Hmm. <laughs> I, many, but I, I've, I have a particular um, fondness for NGC 6781 in Aquila. Um, it's one of the larger planetaries in Aquila. Um, it, it's not uh, stunning in many ways, but it, it's so characteristic. Um, and with um, LRGB, it shows a lot of structure and uh, is, is really rather beautiful. So that, that would probably be my favourite, though I have got others that might run it a close second, third, fourth, fifth, <laughs> so forth. <laughs> I, I like the Helix. I do like the Helix. Um, and also 1514. I like 1514 for, because Herschel observed it, but also for the fact that Herschel actually got it wrong. Herschel thought that he realised that a star in the centre of this mass of nebulosity was, they were obviously connected, but Herschel thought what, it, what was happening was this star was actually being created, that this gas was collapsing to form a star, because it's totally wrong, the star is actually at the end of its life, so one thing that Herschel got wrong. But I do like that object, but I think 6543 is another the cat's eye nebula, is a very nice object. Indeed. But there are many, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. Just pick one. I, I think mine would probably be the Eskimo Nebula um, ah, yeah. 2392, um, partly because of the amount of detail that you you can see in it. Um, so there you go, James. None of us none of us have agreed on <laughs> <laughs> on on any of them, but um, uh, <laughs> I, I think everybody would. I mean, everybody will have a fam favorite object there. Right, uh, Observer Sky Atlas by Karashoka. Have you heard of this? Um, I have heard of it. I don't have it. Um, I believe it's something similar to the Pocket Sky Atlas from Sky and Telescope. Nick or Stuart, do you know anything about that atlas? I've well, never heard of that one, no. I've never heard of it even. Sorry. No. You're doing well, Jack. You stumped us on Star Wars <laughs> 2 and now on, on the Atlas by Karashoka as well. Uh, um, I, I think it's, if I remember rightly, it's a sort of, um, it's a f fairly small scale atlas. Um, 
but it probably almost certainly will contain some of the brighter planetary nebulae marked on it. I was just about to close off and it looks like we've got another question coming. <laughs> so this is from Peter Williams. Um, Observer's Sky Atlas has some very good finders for 250 objects containing some planetary nebulae. Right. Uh, I'm not sure what the observers is that the um, oh the Karas Karasko Shuka one yes okay and uh, yes there's the um, Massimo's at Chin one um, I had hoped he would update that but he doesn't ever seem to have done so but yes it's a, a freely downloadable PDF um, that you can get from from the Web Society's uh, website. Right. Well, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank Owen once again for spending his time giving us this fascinating talk this evening, and also to Nick and Stuart for joining in the Q&A to help this, make this interactive and uh, interesting. Um, again, next week we have the um, talk on supernova Betelgeuse, which is about the um, the recent uh, fading and then return to brightness of Betelgeuse. And uh, that'll be by, Dar by Mark Kidger. And just to remind everyone, um, in case you missed the beginning of this talk, it'll be available on YouTube afterwards. I think they take about an hour to come up on YouTube after the recording ends, and then an edited version will be available tomorrow morning, cutting out the, uh, the pause at the introduction when we get things going. Thank you all, and hope to see you next week. Bye. 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 Thank you.